You got to believe and receive what he reveals to you. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to you right now. He wants, he's trying to give you revelation. He's trying to give you instruction. He's uncovering things that's already hidden. They're already there in your life right now. What happens when there's no revelation? People seek alternatives. What do you mean they seek alternatives? False gods? False doctrines? False prophets? False teachers? Witchcraft? Divination? Now, it's using that, it's almost like someone behind you whispering in your ear. This is what you do. Teresa, do this. James, go this way. Make this move. Close that account. Open this account. Do this. He's giving you revelation. But you got to believe it. And you got to receive it. God speaks to children that same way. Greetings and welcome to the G2GCC broadcast. I am Assistant Pastor Marcus Smith. I want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and hear what the Spirit of the Lord will say to you this day. I want to give you an opportunity to get your Bibles, notepads and tablets and all your devices. Uh, we're going to get into the Word in just a moment. I'm going to pray. We're going to have a, a moment of praise and worship and then the next voice you'll hear will be my own. If you will, in the listening audience, uh, please bow your heads and close your eyes here as well. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's agree together as we go before the throne of grace. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you and praise you, Father, for this day. This day is the day, Father, that you have made. We are rejoicing and we're glad in it. We thank you, Father, for this privilege and this opportunity to hear from you, to hear what the Spirit of the Lord was saying to us, the church. Church. Father, I thank you for the privilege to stand before your people and I ask you, Father, to anoint these lips of clay to speak as an oracle of God under the direction of Holy Spirit. I decrease and Holy Spirit increase within me to think through my mind and speak through my, these vocal cords. Anoint every ear to hear and cause every heart to believe and receive the word. Give them ears to hear eyes to see, a heart to believe and receive the word of God and let revelation flow freely in this place in the name of Jesus. We covet earnestly the best gifts of the spirit to be in operation in this place and let people's lives be changed and transformed for the better. Satan and demon forces flee in terror. You have no place in here. And may the people be set free because they hear from you, Father. We give you praise, we give you honor and glory for all the fruit that shall abound and remain. In Jesus' name, all agree with that prayer, say a hearty. Amen. What does amen mean? Amen. Enjoy the ministry in song. Hey. 
It is my prayer that the word of God has been sown into your heart by way of ministry of song. And now we're going to actually get into the word. So please uh, turn your Bibles to th uh, four opening passages of scripture. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 13. Deuteronomy 29. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think you have at least four fingers. You should be able to separate those. Matthew 16, Matthew 13, Deuteronomy 29, and 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to start with Matthew 16, starting at verse 13. When you have it, say, I have it. And it reads, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Let's look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 10. It says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not. And hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That said, any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Deuteronomy 29. We want to make sure that a solid foundation is laid for what we're sharing. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29. One verse of scripture. It reads, the secret things belong unto the Lord. What things? The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are what? Revealed they belong to who? To us or to me and to who? Our children, the next generation. How long? Forever. That we may do all the words of this law. Finally, let's go to 1 Corinthians 2. And I want to say something before I read this next scripture. For though there are people who come to church forever and ever and ever. And a lot of times you'll hear ministers go over scriptures over and over. And you say, I know that I heard that. I know that I heard that. I know that I heard that. But just because you heard it. If there's no fruit being produced, you may not know what you think, you know. Pastor used to tell us all the time, the word of God is ever pregnant with what? Revelation. Revelation. Starting at well, chapter two, starting at verse number four. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature. 
Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us. And how did he do it? By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth how many things? Some things. A few things. Yea, the what? Deep or profound things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save or accept the spirit of man that which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man except by the spirit of God or but by the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us, which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. Watch this. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. I'm continuing. This is part four of a teaching I started called We Need Revelation. Look at the person on your right and say, you need revelation. Look at the person on the other side and say, you need revelation. As I've stated before, the purpose of this, and go back to your notes, please, and it's best for you to go back to the notes rather than start a new page. <laughs> the purpose of this teaching is to provoke the disciple to seek the Lord for themselves to receive revelation directly from God. You need to seek God for yourself. Don't only depend on the man or woman of God who ministers the word. Yes, you need them because they, God will give them revelation that he may not have given you directly, but you still need to seek the Lord for yourself. Amen. Amen. The goal of this teaching is to equip God's people to overcome the world system, the world's restrictions, the world's limitations to fulfill the will of God in these last days, to equip God's people to overcome the world system, its restrictions, its limitations, to fulfill the will of God in these last days. Now, over the last three parts of this teaching, I addressed um, a couple of different things. I addressed main part number one, which was what is revelation? We talked about what revelation is, went through a thorough detail of what that is. In part two of this message, I dealt with the purpose of revelation. Last week when we were together, I dealt with main point number three and four. Main point three is how do you get revelation as well as types of revelation. We talked about prophetic revelation. We also talked about personal revelation. Today, for time purposes, we're going to go, get, go right into main point number five, which is why is revelation important? Why is revelation important? So we're going to go ahead and go to a couple verses of scripture. Actually, go to Matthew chapter 13, 11. Matthew chapter 13, 11. Matthew 13, verse 11. I'll actually read verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but, not, but to them it is not given. One of the reasons why revelation is important is because revelation gives you access to the mysteries of the kingdom. Revelation gives you access to the mysteries of the kingdom. If I'm trying to get into a room that is locked, I either need someone to let me in or I need someone to give me a key so that I can stick the key in the door, unlock it and go in myself. Revelation gives you access to the mysteries of the kingdom of God. 
Why is revelation important? Revelation gives you the ability to focus and write the word focus, F-O-C-U-S. Write that in bold letters. Revelation gives you the ability to focus on what he reveals. Now, what does that mean? And why did I tell you write down the word focus? Focus is an acronym that stands for follow one course until successful. Revelation gives you what? Focus. What is focus? Follow one course until successful. Before we began this teaching, Elder Johnson began to uh, speak of our pastor and all the things that God has done through our pastor. There is no way in the world that our pastor could have done what, he's, what he did in, the, in this ministry without first and foremost having revelation. But number two, without having what? Focus. What does focus mean? Follow one course until successful. That's why he never, he never deviated to, to anything else. Scripture reference for that, Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 23. Acts 26, verse 14 through 19. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. And I'm going to read Philippians. I have a lot to cover today, so I'm only I'm not going to read a whole lot of scripture. I will get to some of it, but I want to make sure that this one I read. Philippians chapter 3. And again, I want you to think about Jesus. I want you to think about our pastor. I want you to think about any man or woman of God who's followed one course of action until successful. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 12. The Apostle Paul speaking here, he says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing, this what thing? One. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Read those next two words. I What's, read those words again. I, I do what? I, I press toward the mark for what? The prize of the of what call? The high call of God. Where is it? That's what our pastor has done for 20, almost 30 years. That's what Jesus was doing all of his life. That's what every man or woman of God who's ever pursued the call of God, they followed one course of action until they were successful. That's what revelation does. Why is revelation important? Revelation will always contradict your negative experiences. Revelation will always contradict your negative experiences. In John chapter 11, verse, 30, um, verse 38, and four, through, 38 through 40, it talks about the account where Jesus came to town to see Mary, Martha, and his friend Lazarus and found out that Lazarus was dead. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't die. And he, and he says, your brother will live again. She says, I know. I know. That's, that's what some people say. I know. He's, and then he said, well, well, where is he? Well, he's in the cave. He's moved away to stone. He said, uh, Lord, uh, you know, he's been dead four days. And you know, right now, he stink. He said, didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God? Revelation will always contradict your negative experiences. In 2 Kings chapter 7, Go there real quickly. Second Kings seven. In Second Kings chapter seven, this is the account where the children of Israel were basically starving. They were about to go into cannibalism, and Elisha was telling them. And you can read the account on your own, but you can read uh, that account. But he talks about how he says this time tomorrow, twenty four hours from today, you. I know we have a negative experience, but this time tomorrow, it's going to be plenty of food and it's going to be cheap. It's going to be plenty and it's going to be cheap. And the man says in verse number two, then a Lord or a ruler on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? 
And he, Elisha, said, Behold, thou shalt what? See it with thine eyes, but what? Thou shalt not eat thereof. In other words, you're going to see it, but you won't experience it. That's why when you come to church and the word is flowing, it don't matter who stands at this platform. You need to be hearing what God has to say because God will speak something directly to you. And when you hear what the Lord says, because he says, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I know them and they follow me. You can be here and hear the exact same words coming out of someone's mouth, but the Holy Ghost is talking to you and you're able to receive. And God will cause manifestation in your life. Why is revelation important? Revelation points to God's ability. Revelation points to God's ability. In Daniel chapter 2, it, it gives the account of Nebuchadnezzar who had this dream that disturbed him. And he was so disturbed by what he saw. Matter of fact, let's go there. Let's go there. Let's go there real quickly. I want to keep moving holes with that. No, show it to him. Show it to him. Daniel 2. Starting at verse 1. It says, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was what? His spirit was what? In other words, he had what he would have considered to be almost like a nightmare. And his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dream. In other words, interpret the dream. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to him, um, said to them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. In other words, tell us what you dreamed and we'll give you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. I, I don't remember it. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in peace. What? Hold up. Wait, 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 wait. Just get the picture. The king has a dream. The dream disturbs him so much. He's saying everybody, that, scientists, Soothsayers, all of y'all that's wise in my kingdom, tell me what I dream. Give me the interpretation. And if you don't, I'm gonna cut you in pieces. What, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> because the word of the king can have you killed. <laughs> he says, Again, verse five, and the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known to me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces. Watch this. And your houses shall be made a dung here. Your house going to be bulldozed. <laughs> but if you show the dream and the, and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. There's, there's no, no incentive here. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And they... They answered again and said, uh, let the king tell the, the servants the dream and we'll show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know the certainty that ye would gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can tell, excuse me, uh, I shall know that ye can show the interpretation. So in other words, I mean, he, he's basically threatening him. As you go through the story, you'll see they say, look, there's nobody that can do this except the gods. And then Daniel comes on the scene. And as you read it, you'll see that Daniel and his three friends, they began to intercede. They got together and intercede and God gave the interpretation. And Daniel not only saved his life and the, the, the three men's life, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he also saved everybody else's life. Never underestimate the power of intercession. But revelation will always point to God's ability. Next point, revelation gives you mastery over mysteries. Revelation gives you mastery over what? Mysteries. Same 
group of scriptures in Daniel chapter 2, but there's also one that, uh, in Genesis chapter 41 when the Pharaoh has a dream. And the dream he has is about a famine that's coming. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. The only way he knew that was because God gave revelation to a man named Joseph. He was able to interpret the dream and not only interpretation of the dream, but he also was able to give a blueprint, a plan of action. Why is that important? We're living in times right now where we need Joseph's to rise up. We need Joseph's to rise up. Think about this. Why did no one, what prophetic voices were speaking to warn us about the coronavirus? What prophetic voices were warning us about the economy about to change? What prophetic voices were telling us about how the economy is about to shift and how we're about to step into a technocracy? Look that word up, technocracy. T-E-C-H-N-O-C-R-A-C-Y. Technocracy. Think of democracy, but instead of democracy, technocracy. Look it up. That's what we're about to step into. You need to know what a technocracy is. You need to know about digitalization. You need to know about globalization. You need to know about automation. You need to know about monetization. You need to know about uh, privatization because they want to privatize everything. And Daniel, Daniel talks about uh, how there's gonna come a time where knowledge is going to increase. There's a technology, G-A-I-T, called gate technology. It has to do with biotechnology where it picks up how you walk to identify you, pick you out in a crowd. Facial recognition, retina recognition, voice recognition, all of that is part of the technocracy that our leaders are planning globally. Revelation gives you mastery over mysteries. Next, revelation provokes you to take action. Again, using our pastor as an example, our pastor moved from Los Angeles, California, where it very rarely gets colder than, what, 70 degrees? Always talked about how he used to swim in the ocean, enjoying the sun. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Tupac who did a song called California Love. And people talk about California and how beautiful L.A. is. Our pastor left that environment to come to St. Louis to obey God. He had a revelation of who God was. He had a revelation of who he is. He had a revelation of what God wanted him to do. And he came here. Forgive every person who's ever spoken an evil word against our pastor. More than two million people came through these doors because one man chose to obey God. Amen. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 through 24 relates to revelation provokes you to take action. Revelation shines, next point, revelation shines light on the word of God. Revelation shines light on the word of God. Re uh, scripture reference for that is... Um, uh, Psalms 119 verse 105 as well as 130. Revelation brings light to your situation. Again, we have these lights. And all the cameramen, they always make sure that they have the proper lighting so that you can see the speaker or see things properly. You and I need light to see. And that light is called what? Revelation. Revelation is more valuable and more powerful than reason. Let me say that again. Revelation is more valuable and more powerful than reason. Look at 2 Kings. 2 Kings 5. Oh, gosh. 2 Kings 5. This is the account... Uh, I'm in the wrong 
chapter. 2 Kings 5. This is the account of Naaman. And Naaman is uh, a captain, captain of a military arm, army. And we're going to start down in verse number nine. Naaman is a man who he, he's not only captain of army, but he also has leprosy. He has this skin condition where the skin, the flesh start, it turns white and starts to fall off and dries up and stuff like that. And people died from it. We're going to start at verse number nine. It says, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Who is Elisha? He's a prophet of God. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Now you got to understand Jordan was a dirty, filthy, nasty river like the Mississippi. But Naaman was, he was what? He was angry. He was wroth. And he went away and said, behold, I thought, I thought. He would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpah rivers of Damascus better than the waters of Israel? All the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So in other words, he's saying, look, this is his natural mind. These waters are clean. That water nasty. Certainly the man going to come out and be healed. <laughs> he talking about go wash over there in a nasty, dirty river. Verse 13, and his servant came near and spake unto him and said, my father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Like your body is jacked up. You, 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 your body is dying. How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. When he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was what? He was what? Now all he had to do was obey. Bottom line is revelation will... <laughs> Revelation is more valuable and more powerful than your reasoning. Let's go to main point number six. Main point six. What happens when there is no revelation? Number one, you cannot access what you cannot see or perceive. You cannot access what you cannot see or perceive. John 3. If you remember, Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him. He said, uh, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. And he was about to ask the question, how are you doing these things? Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot what? See the kingdom of God. And then he says, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But you cannot, revelation gives you, you cannot access what you cannot see or perceive. That's why revelation is, uh, this is what happens when there is no revelation. You cannot access what you cannot see or perceive. Number two, you cannot apply or experience what you cannot access. You cannot apply what you cannot access. John 3 verse 1 through 5. What happens when there is no revelation? People cast off restraint. People run wild. People perish. Is that biblical? Yes. Proverbs 29, 18 says where there is no vision, which another translation says where there is no prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint, they run wild. When there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, they run wild and they perish. What happens when there's no revelation? Confusion and frustration sets in. Confusion and frustration when there is no revelation. I think I told you before by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit told me that there's four instances in which vision, and here, this gets into another teaching on vision, but when, why vision, when, people come to, uh, when people come together. He said, number one, when there's a crisis. People come together whenever, whenever there's a crisis. Number two, people come together when there is a common enemy. When people perceive that they have a common enemy coming at them, they will gather together. Number three, they come together whenever there is a financial opportunity. When people see they have an opportunity to make money, they come together. Number four, they come together whenever there is a divine vision. 
that divine vision is referred to as revelation. Next, what happens when there is no revelation? <clears throat> Excuse me. People do what's right in their own eyes. What's wrong with that? I don't know. We just, our state just passed a law that says, as of this past week, if you're 21, you can now use marijuana legally. You can grow it in your house or grow it in your backyard. Right? You ain't know that? They expect, and the, re the reasoning behind it is because they anticipate $1.3 billion of tax revenue. In Genesis, Genesis, God, God tells Adam, and he, he speaks to Adam, the humanity. He says, you're supposed to have dominion over the birds of the air, fish of the sea, beasts of the field, over all the cattle, over every creamy thing that creeps upon the earth, and over all the earth. That includes herbs, cannabis, hemp, coca, cocaine. All those things come from the earth. He says, you're supposed to have dominion over it, not have it dominion over you. Amen. People do what's right in their own eyes. Proverbs 12, verse 15, as well as Proverbs 21, verse 2. What happens when there is no revelation? People are stuck and remain stagnant. When you don't have revelation, you can't move forward. You're stuck. You have to try to reinvent yourself when the industry that you have gone to school and gotten training in that industry shuts down because of technology. Oh, we talked about that earlier, didn't we? You have to figure out how do I take care of myself now? How do I pay my bills? How do I feed my kids? How do I take care of my retirement? You need revelation. I'm not, I'm not here to try to talk about stuff to make you fearful. I want you to see why revelation is important and what happens when you don't have it. People remain stuck and stagnant. Matthew 13, verse 19 through 22, as well as 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 7. When there is no revelation, people produce no fruit with their lives. We saw that in Matthew 13, 9 through 13. What happens when there's no revelation? People don't believe. People can't get healed. People can't be delivered. People don't get saved. When there is no revelation. John 12, 40. Acts 27, 28. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 through 4. In fact, he says something interesting in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 through 4. He says, let God, let God be true. Let God be true. And all of us a lie. Is that the word? Let God be true. That's why we have to always defer to him. Not our intellect. We don't have enough intellect or enough degrees to know more than God. Amen. Amen. About anything. Amen. What happens when there's no revelation? People become ineffective and engage in the works of the flesh. Say it another way. People work in their own strength and cannot work the works of the kingdom. They become ineffective, they engage in the works of the flesh, they work in their own strength, they cannot do the works of the kingdom. Matthew 17, verse 14 through 20, and Romans 8, verse 5 through 8. What happens when there's no revelation? People seek alternatives. What do you mean they seek alternatives? False gods, false doctrines, False prophets, false teachers, witchcraft, divination. You can read that in 1 Samuel 28, verse 1 through 19. This is the account of King Saul. He is, he, he, he bans all of the soothsayers, all the 
necromancers, folks who are talking to the dead and stuff like that, all people, wizards and warlocks, he bans all of them. Say, get out of here. Prophet Samuel, I mean, uh, Prophet Samuel, he dies. He's got an army coming against him, and then he's seeking the Lord. The Lord ain't talking to him. The Lord ain't talking to the priest. The Lord is not talking to any prophets in the land. So he goes to a woman, Miss Cleo, who knows how to talk to the dead. And he has her to try to call up Samuel because he didn't have any revelation. <laughs> you see the same thing in Acts chapter 13, verse 6 through 12. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 22, and Acts 17, verse 16 through 23. I'll give those again. Acts 13, verse 6 through 12, Acts 16, verse 16 through 22, and Acts 17, verse 16 through 23. All of these were instances where the men of God came in contact with a city and an environment that was full of alternative worship seeking other gods and seeking other methods to try to talk to God and hear from God and learn from God. And what happens when there's no revelation? God gets no glory. John 1 verse 1 through, excuse me, John 11 verse 1 through 4. Revelation points to God and gives Him glory. Everything that we do should give God glory. We sing to the glory of God. We teach to the glory of God. We perform to the glory of God. Everything we do should be done for what reason? The glory of God. So lastly, main point seven. We made it. <laughs> How to apply revelation. How do we apply revelation? Let's look at Isaiah. 30. Isaiah chapter 30. I want you to think about something. I want to show you what revelation looks like. In Revelation, uh, excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 30, we're going to look at verse 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Verse 21, And thy ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. How you apply revelation is you must believe and receive what God tells you. When you receive revelation, a lot of times, pastor is not there. A man of God is not there with you. Preachers, fivefold ministry, they're not there with you. But you're reading the word, praying, talking to the Lord. And, the God, and God tells you, this is what you need to do. Take this step, take this step, do this, close this out. He says, this is the way. Where did he say you would hear it? He said, you would hear a voice. Where will you hear it? Look at 21 again. And thine ears shall hear the, a word behind thee saying, where is the word? Now, it's using that. It's almost like someone behind you whispering in your ear. This is what you do. Teresa, do this. James, go this way. Make this move. Close that account. Open this account. Do this. He's giving you revelation. But you got to believe it. And you got to receive it. God speaks to children that same way. Look at Psalm 23. When I saw this, I said, huh. When the Lord showed me this, I thought this was interesting. I said, you must believe and receive what God reveals to you. 
Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my... The Lord is my... He's your what? I shall not... Hmm. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. What else does he do? He what? He what? He what? He what? He what? He leads or he's leading you. Where? Beside still waters. He's leading you. You got to believe and receive what he reveals to you. Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to you right now. He wants, he's trying to give you revelation. He's trying to give you instruction. He's uncovering things that's already hidden. They're already there in your life right now. Plug in. Listen to what he's saying. Write down what he tells you to do. And then he'll, he'll, he'll give, you, give you the next instruction. You must, how do you apply revelation? You must speak the word or the promise that is revealed to you. 2 Corinthians 4. I told you you must believe and receive what God reveals to you, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, one verse of scripture. It says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore what? You have to believe and receive what God reveals to you. But then after that, you got to begin to speak what he reveals. Why? Because when you speak what he reveals to you, you authorize him to take action on your behalf because he hastens not your word. He hastens his word to perform it. So when we confess the word, it's one thing to confess it and say it over and over and over and over and over and over again. But if you don't believe it, that's why I said right here, I believe. Therefore, have I spoken. Our pastor drilled a principle, and I was wondering, why does he keep saying that? The principle is this, found in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 11. Have faith in God. For whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, then he shall have whatsoever he so he drilled that into us. I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. No, you got to believe that what you say will come to pass. If you don't believe what you say will come to pass, guess what? You, you know this in terms of from a negative standpoint. I wish they would. You, you say that all the time. Somebody does something, offends you, gets on you. I wish they would. I will out. Dot, 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 dot. God shows you something, but you don't believe it. And you don't say it. Once it becomes yours, nobody can dynamite it away from you. You must speak the promise that is revealed to you. 2 Corinthians 4.13, Mark 11.23-24, Job 22.28. It says, thou shalt also decree a thing. And it shall be established. I'm on this platform. This platform, I couldn't stay on this platform unless it was established. Amen. Jeremiah 1.12. For I will hasten my word to perform it. Numbers 23.19. God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a man that he should lie. That means what? Men do what? Lie. But God is not a man that he should that doesn't just mean that God is not someone who cannot tell the he, he can't tell the truth, but God can never be separated from his word because God and his word are one. How do you get how do you apply revelation? You must act on God's instruction when it is revealed. You must act on God's instruction when it is revealed. John 7 verse 15 through 18. 
John 16, verse 13 through 15. Romans 8, 16. I'm going to give the scriptures to you again. Galatians 1, verse 15 through 17, and James 1, 22. What does James 1, 22 say? But be ye, be ye, be ye, be ye of what? The word and not hearers. Those scriptures again were John 7, verse 15 through 18. John 16, verse 13 through 15. Romans 8, verse 16. Galatians 1, verse 15 through 17. And James 1, 22. And I got to quit because I'm out of time. <clears throat> I would encourage you to go back and listen to all four, all four parts of this, this series, of this series. Because there's things that the Lord is speaking to us right now that we need to hear. I'm eagerly anticipating more teaching to come in, along these lines from the other ministers of God. I'm not telling you to do it, I'm just saying I'm anticipating because I know I've already spoken to one person who God was already dealing with about the same subject matter before I even got up to speak. The things, are, the times and seasons are changing, family. And we're gonna need revelation to move as God leads and directs us. We need to hear what he is saying. We, don't, we need to block out all these extra voices and hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us individually, collectively, as a church, as a ministry, and as the body of Christ. Amen. And for those of you on the listening audience or under the sound of my voice, if you're not a part of the body of Christ, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord, this is your opportunity. In the day that you hear my voice, God says, harden not your heart. Today is the day that you need to respond. I don't know in the natural all the things that's going to occur in the coming months, in the coming weeks. But I do know this. God is speaking and God is not done. God is going to get his glory. God's will is going to be done. And I want to be a part of what he is doing. And I want to give you an opportunity to be a part of what he's doing. It begins with you making a quality decision to ask him to come into your life, to be your Lord. And it begins with this prayer. Repeat these words after me. Say, Dear God in heaven, I come to you with a need to acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and Savior. You said in your word, if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I would be saved. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sin and who was raised from the dead for my justification. I receive him now as my Lord and Savior. You also said in your word, if I would ask for Holy Spirit, you would give him to me. I ask you to fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come inside me, lead me, guide me, Direct my life, teach me the word, give me the revelation of who I am, of who you are, and what my purpose in life is. Thank you, Father, for saving me and for filling me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We celebrate you right now here in this house, and we celebrate you. Because the angels in heaven are celebrating you right now. The Bible says that all of heaven right now is celebrating you. Rejoicing that another one, we got another one. Your soul was already paid for. And now you get to be reconciled so that you can be restored. Amen. At the bottom of your screen is our website, g2gcc.org. Please go to that website. You may see a section, a comment section. Type on there, I received Jesus today. We want to celebrate with you. And not too many days from now, you can join us in our new facility. If you want to give us a call, you can call us at the number at the bottom of your screen, 314-867-1894, and we will celebrate with you. And what I want to do at this point in time is I want to pray a blessing over you.
Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever until our next broadcast. We bid you shalom.